People are eager to call Jesus Lord, but they refuse to worship Him. Jesus must be crowned both Savior and Lord of your life. Most find it easier to crown Him Savior. Everybody would like to be saved. Everybody would like to be saved and then to, have, and then to crown Him Lord. To crown Him Lord means I will let Jesus run my life. Folks, I'm just going to tell you straight up. Speaking from experience, you can't go wrong from letting Jesus run your life. You can't go wrong. You really can't. Letting Jesus run your life calls all signals for it. For Jesus to run your life. I will follow where He leads rather than to, de than to demand my own way. Many of us do not want anyone else running our lives. How many of that is true today? There are so many people. Don't be telling me what to do. You, you ain't my mama. You ain't my daddy. Don't be telling me what to do, where to go. You ain't my girlfriend. You ain't my boyfriend. Don't be telling me. That's too true. I don't see a ring on this finger. You ain't married to me. Don't be telling me what to do. People with attitudes like that, they don't want no one running their life. They want to do it themselves. But a true sign of worshiping Jesus is that you let Jesus run your life for you. And you don't mind where He leads you in your life. Lord knows I've got many testimonies of where he's led me, I didn't want to go, but I went because he asked me to go, and I did. And I thought it would be bad, but it ended up turning out to be really good. I trusted Jesus. I followed Jesus. I let Jesus tell me what to do. I wasn't sure of it, but I knew he was. I didn't think it would turn out good, but it actually turned out very excellent. Very excellent. Many of us do not want anyone else running our lives, including Jesus. We rebel against Him. This is the root of sin, and it is what Jesus died for. Jesus died for all sin. Question 18. How difficult is it sometimes for me to let the Lord lead me where He knows I should go? Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30. Matthew chapter 5 has also Jesus teaching on the mountain. He's given the Beatitudes. But in the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30, we'll find how you can let Jesus lead in your life. It says, And if your right eye offend you, pluck it out, and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish, and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. And if your right hand offend you, cut it off, and cast it from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish, and not that your whole body should be cast into hell. Now folks, don't take me serious on this. Don't take Jesus too serious on that. This is a symbol. This is a symbol. It is hard to pluck an eye out or cut off a limb. It's real hard for a person to do that. Now there is truth in this. Don't get me wrong. We will touch more on this in our future lessons. Questions 19. 
Why is it absolutely imperative for me to crown Jesus Lord and allow Him to abide within me and call signals for my life? Go back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1. Back when it all started. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Here we find where God just made the earth. He made the animals. He made the land, the waters, the trees, the birds. And He made everything. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 read, And God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. Fowl means birds. And over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created Him, male and female created He them. We're created in the image of God. That's what, when you, when you accept Jesus into your life, you're saying, restore me back to what you had originally intended me to be. Before Adam and Eve sinned, restore me to that point. Help me take the sin out of my life. Because I'm too weak to do it. Satan's too powerful for me. But God, I know you're more powerful than Satan. So I'm asking you to come into me. Help take away the sin. And restore me back to what you meant for me to be. Because this isn't what we're meant to be, folks. We're not meant to be this way. Let's go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. No, because we're going from Old Testament to New Testament. You can't have the old without the new, and you can't have the new without the old. They go together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 and 23 read, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through, there's that word, through, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corrupt, corruptibility or corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So when you were you born from the other Spirit, and you go and you repent, and you confess your sins, and then you convert, you don't do them no more. You don't defile, you don't corrupt your new self. Now, I've been baptized, and I've been baptized according to the Bible, the way the Bible says it. And I'm a sinner. I've, I've failed many, many times. So, it is a hard task to do. But folks, with God, all things are possible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. In the beginning, man was created in God's image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Sin has virtually destroyed God's image in man, but it is the gospel's plan to restore within us. At conversion, the old life dies and a new life, which comes from the new birth, begins. 
Remember how I said that when you're baptized into the water and into the, by the Spirit, all your old sins, all your whole life, all the sins you've made, if you haven't been baptized and you convert and you give yourself to God, everything at that moment is forgiven. You have a clean slate. Your old, your old self is dead. Spiritually. You get a new chance in life. Don't run it. Don't run it. Because that's when the new birth begins. New, new character created by God in you. And that chance is to get you back to the image of God when He created us to begin with in the beginning. Growth in the Christian life is what restores man to the image of God in which He was created in the beginning. If I permit Jesus to abide within me and miraculously run my life, He will restore God's image within and will fit me for a place in His kingdom. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we become a new person when we're baptized. Your old life, your old sins, if you stole, you, you, you murdered, anything. Because all manner of sin is forgiven, except for one, the unpardonable sin. But trust me, if you hear the Word of God speak to you, you're feeling compelled to be baptized and follow the Word of God, trust me, folks, you have not committed the unpardonable sin. You're headed the right way. And when you get baptized by the Spirit and by the water, all your old sins, it doesn't matter if you're 75 years old. You've never been baptized before in your life and you believe in God. You had a change in heart. You honestly believe what the Bible says. You believe Jesus is working in you. You will get baptized. Everything, your whole life is gone. You're forgiven. It's a clean slate. Spiritually speaking, a new person is created in you. It's like as if you've never sinned. But from the time you get baptized to the time you die, that is what you're going to be held accountable for. Now, whenever a person is baptized, a person cannot be fully expected to walk a straight line. It takes steps, like baby steps. What I like to call when a person gets baptized according to the Gospels, the way Jesus was, when a person is baptized that way, they are newborn, they're reborn, they're infants in the Word of Christ. They're like little babies. I'm not calling you a baby. I'm saying you're like a little baby. And the only way you're going to grow from the infant stage is by studying the Word of God. Search your Scriptures daily. Build a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do Jesus' commands. 
follow the ways of God the Father. That's how you grow as a Christian once you're baptized. And it takes steps. It's taken me 20 years. It's taken me 20 years just to get to this point. And I'm not even there. I consider myself still way low on the steps. Question 20. How can we know that Jesus has accepted us when we ask? How do we know that when we say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I've lived a bad life, I've done a lot of wrong in my life, accept me for who I am, where I am, how can we know that Jesus will accept us? Excuse me, what kind of a word do we have? Let's look. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. And folks, once again, I'm not going to mislead you. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says. And I'm going to let you all decide. But I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says from the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you the truth. So, how can we know that Jesus has accepted us when we ask? 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, see there's the first part, you have to confess your sins. If we confess our sins, He, Jesus Christ, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness, right? I'm testing y'all. He cleanses us from all of our unrighteousness, which means everything you've done in your past, when you go to Jesus and you accept Him, you get baptized, everything you've done up to that point in your life is cleansed. Like it never happened. How could you not want that? Because if you ain't baptized according to the Word of God, you're not going home. Now true, God makes uh, room for errors or people who can't get baptized. For instance, you take the, the three crosses when Jesus was crucified. He had... Two men, one on each side of him, up on the crosses. Remember the three crosses at the cross of Calvary? There was three crosses. Jesus and two thieves. One thief couldn't be baptized, but he believed that the one hanging in the middle on his right side of his cross, he believed that was Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus said, I tell you today that you will be with me in paradise. Now, that thief didn't, wasn't able to come down and be baptized. Jesus made a provision. He made a way for certain people in certain situations to go into the kingdom of heaven. But if you have the chance and the opportunity to be baptized, do it. Don't just sit around waiting and then when you're on your, your uh, death table, you're going to be like, huh, wait a minute, Doc, I need to get baptized real quick because you're not going to go. You can't just cheat your way into heaven. You can't do that. You can't cheat. you gotta, you got to do... There's steps involved. You've got to grow in Christ. But we have a sure word that He will cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness if we confess our sins to Him, Jesus Christ. We are saved by God's grace through faith. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, if you're taking notes, Jesus promised salvation and acceptance. Jesus cannot lie. If you think God is a liar, folks, you need more help than what I can offer. Because Jesus isn't a liar. He can't lie. Satan is a liar. And he's the father of it. So when I ask for salvation and I give myself to Jesus, I receive it that very moment. There's no line for you to wait in. There's no way of thinking to say, well, I'll pray now, but I know it's going to take a little bit before for Jesus to get to my prayer. So, you know, no, it doesn't work that way. Jesus is God. He's all-knowing. Once you confess your sins to Him, it goes to Him that very moment. There is no waiting in line. That's how important you are to Him. That's how much He loves you. And that also proves that He's God because how many people are uplifting themselves to Jesus at the same time you are? There's a lot of people. But He will get to you that very moment because He promised He will. Faith means I accept it and claim it at once because He promised it. And not because I feel it or see anything different. But because you believe it. You have faith. Question 21. How may I strengthen my faith? How can we strengthen our belief in God? Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 will tell us how we can strengthen ourselves. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How can we strengthen ourselves? How can we strengthen our faith? By listening to God's Word. By reading God's Word. By searching your Scriptures daily with God. Building a relationship with Jesus. How may I strengthen my faith? Study the Word of God. That's how you strengthen your faith. What's the Word of God? From Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to Revelation chapter 22 to the end of that chapter. Everything in between. That's how you strengthen your relationship with God. All have some faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 tells us. We strengthen our faith by studying God's Word. This is, of course, one great key purpose of this meeting. Because by coming to these meetings, you're going to strengthen your faith. Because I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you what's in the Word of God. People may not agree with me, but it's okay. It's not me you're going to argue with. It's going to be the Word of God. You can find an answer to that in Exodus, uh, I believe it's Exodus 16, verse 8. And I'm going to go ahead and find that real quick. Because I know that there's people out there that will glance through these videos and they will say, oh, well, I can't fully trust that. I can't fully believe that. Well, I'm teaching you from the Word of God. I'm not teaching you from any other Bible. I'm not teaching you from any other source. I'm giving it to you straight from the King James Version. So if you have an argument with me, Folks, it's not me you have an argument with. It's right here. Exodus chapter 16, verse 8. For the Lord hears your murmurs which you murmur against Him. And what are we? Your murmurs are not against us or me, but against the Lord. So if you have issues about what I'm 
teaching or putting out there or guiding you through the Word of God. Folks, it's not against me that you've got your problems with. It's against God. Question number 22. How will true conversion change my life? Now this is a five answer part to this question. There's five answers to this. So we're going to go through them a little quick here. So stay, uh, keep up with me here. How will true conversion change my life? Let's go to the Gospel of John chapter 13 verse 35. John 13, 35. By this will all men know that you are my disciples. If, now there's that word again, if. That means condition. If you want to or not. That's what this means. If you have love one to another. Let me read it again. John chapter 13, verse 35. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. You will begin to love other people. If you feel hatred 